So in the last meeting, uh, we learned Renaissance art. What was the Renaissance, everyone? We learned it. It was a um, no, enormous um, cultural movement uh, between the 15th and the six, uh, 17th century after the midterm. I'm sorry, after the uh, Middle Ages uh, for the resistance of the Middle Ages. So during the Middle Ages, the artist was the, um, you know, the craftsman. Um, but through this um, Renaissance movement, uh, artists uh, can uh, flourish the uh, ancient Greek and ancient Rome. So uh, the masters of the Renaissance, um, they developed like this five uh, techniques like perspective, chiaroscuro, observation of nature, study of anatomy, theories of beauty and proportion. Um, so we learned the reason why the Renaissance began in Italy, because, you know, the first reason was the powerful city-states with the trade and banking. They have a, you know, a very strong economy system to develop the culture. Um, and the second reason was the church. They were the patron for artists. And the last reason was the ancient Rome. So... That was the reason. And we learned, you know, three masters, Leonardo da Vinci, and Michelangelo. And the last master, Raphael. And the, after death of Raphael, um, the high Renaissance is over. And the uh, late Renaissance is called like mannerism. So mannerism was um, you now like the descendant of the um, Michelangelo's art style, like this, a little bit more exaggerated. And they have multiple focal point and disorder and disproportion. That that's the mannerism art. Um, features. And now uh, we're going to watch this um, North Europe's uh, Renaissance art uh, video together. So this video is um, one hour video, so we are not going to watch all of them. So we're going to just watch the, uh, uh, the beginning part of the video, which is uh, important. And then uh, after this meeting, uh, you're going to continue to watch the video independently. Rebirth began in the 16th century with the first modern historians of art. Most of whom, as it happened, were Italian. Filled with local pride, they obscured the nature of the great century of change. For 100 years earlier, in the 15th century, even Italians looked northward to the art of Jan van Eyck for examples of supreme artistic achievement. Jan van Eyck made paintings that for the first time resembled almost perfectly the real world. So much so that he transformed the craft of painting into the supreme art. His work launched an artistic renaissance in Northern Europe that rivals the achievements of his Italian contemporaries and that remains uncannily relevant to us today. I'll be telling the story of this other renaissance, this Northern one. It's an astonishing movement that founded some of our most deeply held beliefs about art and about artists. It begins with a new way of painting, but it soon expands to become a true image revolution. At around 1500, a young German painter harnessed a new technology that transformed everything. 
the printing press made images available to a vastly expanded audience. And this painter used it to become the first world famous artist. Soon the image revolution of the North became a revolt against images. Instead of making images, people passionately broke them. And in the wake of that destruction, modern art was born. Taken together, these breakthroughs created a northern renaissance that changed art forever. In the year 1420, Europe was a continent in the shadow of an unprecedented catastrophe. Just 60 years earlier, plague had wiped out more than a third of the entire population. The church stood divided with rival popes in Rome and Avignon. Meanwhile, the old political powers of the North, England and France, were locked in a conflict that would last 100 years. But one area above all others was flourishing, Flanders in present-day Belgium and Holland. And from there, a profound artistic revolution spread out across the continent. St. Bavo's Cathedral in Ghent still holds the painting, a great altarpiece, that started that revolution. Altarpiece has overwhelmed viewers since it stood complete in 1432. People of the time pronounced it the most beautiful work in Christendom, and its chief creator, Jan van Eyck, was deemed the prince of painters. Today it remains arguably the finest single painting in the world, and of all its many wonders, the one most singled out for praise is the figure of Adam. To early observers, this painted Adam looked like a living being. Paint captures the minute subtleties of flesh. Blood seems to pulse beneath flesh, and the skin of Adam's hands and face is visibly tanned by the sun. One detail intensifies this semblance of animation. Adam raises his big toe so that you can see its underside. The toe seems even to stick out of the stone niche where the figure stands, allowing Adam to appear to step into our world. Remember, this is Adam, Adam who sinned, who therefore died, and who as the ongoing consequence of his sin made us all mortal. In the painting, Adam lives again. Resurrected, he strides towards the paradise he lost. For the first time in the history of art, the dead were seen to live again. And with this rebirth, a new historical epoch began. Here in Northern Europe, this period had a different shape and different heroes mm -hmm. than the more famous Renaissance in Italy. Yet in a sense, the Northern Renaissance is the more stunning rebirth. And the man who launched it here in Ghent was, according to the people of the time, the greatest painter who ever lived. And through astonishing paintings like this, Jan van Eyck reinvented what his craft at its highest level could do. More than any single artist, he made painting 
into the ultimate art. During the preceding century, all across Europe, the supreme arts, both in price and in status, were luxury objects made of a mixture of expensive materials. Today, these are generally consigned to museums of decorative or applied art. The market for these objects was international, centered on the courts of royalty and nobility. And because these artists themselves circulated through these courts, all works, no matter what their medium or purpose, have the same recognizable look and the same elegant style. Style advertised a person's belonging to a certain lifestyle. It exhibited the magnificence that distinguished nobles from ordinary people. Things in the courtly style aimed to look expensive. Ideally, they consisted of the most expensive materials worked in the most time-consuming ways. This explains the dominance of tapestries as an art form. The finest tapestries would be woven of silk thread, individually entwined in silver and gold. They told stories commemorating famous victories or religious scenes. But by the beginning of the 15th century, the hunger for such ostentatiously luxurious objects, such as tapestry, began to be replaced by a taste for something new. And this change took root in the most lavish culture in Europe of the time, the court of the Duke of Burgundy. To recover that now forgotten world, we need to travel south from Flanders. The dynasty of the Dukes of Burgundy had its traditional seat in the wine-growing regions southeast of Paris. But through marriage, diplomacy and war, their territories eventually stretched all the way back to Flanders. In this culture, magnificence publicized power. Indeed, the Dukes sincerely believed that their own lavish spending trickled down to benefit the entire population of Burgundy. According to economic theorists of the day, courtly expenditure was like the wind that drives the windmills, like the rain that fertilizes the fields. The works the Dukes commissioned included hundreds of huge, precious tapestries, enough to cover their many residences inside and out. Useless but staggeringly costly objects made of gold, gems, pearls, and opaque enamel were displayed briefly, only to be melted down to make new confections. Indeed, like the fabulous foods served at Burgundian court festivities, such works took long to prepare but were swiftly consumed. The first Duke of an expanded Burgundy assembled a dazzling team of artists, including one momentous innovator, the Netherlandish sculptor Klaus Sluter. And it's in his work, in the medium of carved stone, that a new realism first appears. Before Sluter, in the great cathedrals of Western Europe, monumental sculpture remained subordinate to architecture. Inert figures stood contained by the structures they embellished. Sluder changed all this. Imagine you lived in the year 1400, and you were asked to predict which art would reign supreme over the next 600 years. I think if you came to the well of Moses here in Dijon, you would place your bet on sculpture. The sculptor of this well, Sluder, has been able to do things with stone which no one previously had been able to do. He is able to give each of these figures of Old Testament prophets a gravity 
and a presence which makes them look like living beings. It's not simply the way he represents them in the round as figures capable of movement, but it's also the way he individualizes each of the figures. The way the shoes are built, the way the clothing hangs, such that each of the figures seems both alive and completely individualized. While painting was an important art in this period, it was not yet the art of arts. Indeed, it was often little more than an embellishment to sculpture. Altarpieces of the period show clearly that sculpture was the dominant craft. Paintings occur in these ensembles on the shutters, on the outer part, the everyday side. They tell stories and prepare the way for the glorious spectacle that will occur when they open up. And that spectacle, that climax, both ritually as well as aesthetically of the altarpiece, occurs in the medium of sculpture, not painting. The painting on the wings of this altarpiece in Dijon was created by the artist Melchior Bruderlam just 12 years before the Ghent altarpiece. It's typical of painting of the time. And while the stories it tells are clear, the figures in them, and especially the spaces between them, look awkward to the modern eye. All right, so I'm going to stop the video right here. And please, everyone, uh, continue to watch this North um, Europe's Renaissance art. Um, the video is in the week 11-1, uh, the Renaissance page. Mm. And uh, we have a, a sketchbook project today. So we learned the Renaissance, right? Uh, in the last meeting, and the masters of the Renaissance discovered uh, and used perspective drawing technique um, to create the implied space on the two-dimensional surface. So today we are going to do the perspective drawing to understand um, their technique for the um, sketch project. So. Um, so the perspective linear or point projection perspective is uh, one of the two types of graphical projection uh, perspective in the graphic art. Linear perspective is an approximate uh, representation, generally on a flat surface, such as um, paper of an image as it is seen by the eye. The most characteristic features of linear perspective are that um, objects appear smaller as their distance from the observer increases. Mm, and that um, they are um, subject to foreshortening, meaning that an object's um, dimensions along the line of sight appear shorter than its dimensions across the line of sight. Also, all objects will recede to points in the distance, usually along the horizon line, but also above, the, um, above and below the horizon line, depending on uh, view used. So, this is the last super by Leonardo da Vinci. Um, so in this painting, he used one point linear perspective um, with the vanishing point on the center of the implied space. So this is a good perspective technique for compacting many objects in a limited space. 
So here is another example of a one-point linear perspective drawing. And this is two-point linear perspective drawing. So uh, as you can see, there are two points um, on the, you know, um, the left and the right side of the um, drawing. Um, it is a good technique to show a dynamic view uh, with the uh, foreshortening in the work of art. And here's another example of two point linear perspective drawing. So as you see, it is slightly harder than the one point perspective because of um, uh, it added one more point. Uh, so uh, that makes the work a little bit more complicated but looks a little bit more dynamic compared to the one point perspective drawing. So for this project, you will need a sketchbook ruler. You will need a ruler um, to find the, uh, the angle of the uh, perspective. Um, and you will need pencil, eraser, and any color medium you have. Um, I will give you nine options for this project and please choose one of them, uh, one of the options and must draw one of the option based on the uh, one point or two point linear perspective. And as usual, please write um, which option you choose uh, for this project and post your uh, work process image uh, by tonight on the mood room. Uh, and by tomorrow, reply to your peers. So let me show you the options. Um, the option file is posted in uh, week 11 page. So uh, you can see it while you're drawing. So this is uh, the first option, two point linear perspective. So all the photos, all the option pictures um, have the perspective guide you know, on the right corner. So um, you know, it has the you know, angle and then where is the point. And this is the next option, uh, one point linear perspective with the vanishing point. And this is the third option, uh, two point linear perspective picture. Uh, it looks a little bit you know, complicated and hard. And this is the fourth option, uh, two point linear perspective. And fifth option, two point linear perspective. And the sixth option, uh, which has the two point linear perspective. Um, even though this picture um, showing the two point linear perspective, but um, this is the one of the easiest one. And um, this is the seventh option with the one point linear perspective. So the vanishing point is a hiding um, of the wall. And this is the eighth option, um, one point linear perspective with the vanishing point. And this is the last option, two point linear perspective. So please choose one of the option and you're gonna draw it based on the perspective role. So again, you're gonna choose an image uh, in the options. We just you know saw together. Um, again, the uh, the option files um, is in the uh, model room week eleven page. So please check the um, the option file again. And uh, check out check out your uh, image, and then um, like you know whether one point uh, or two point perspective uh, in your picture, and sketch it, uh, sketch the image option on your sketchbook based on the perspective role. You now see, so it's a two point linear perspective. So just to find the angle, and then. You're going to color it with any medium you have. 
I use a pastel for this drawing. So um, I will show you how to start a one point and two point perspective drawing. So um, I'm gonna share a recording I made before. So this is the option uh, six, uh, which is a two point linear perspective. Uh, so I'm using the ruler um, to find the uh, you know, perspective angles from the left wall and the right side wall. So like this, you know, to find the perspective angle and the perspective point, you, you know, when you make a line through the wall and the floor, then you can find the perspective point easily like this. See, I just found one point on the right side from the left wall to check the angles. And now I will find the another point because this room has the two point perspective. So see, I just draw the line from the right ceiling and then right side, you know, the bottom line. So uh, on the left side, you know, at some point the lines will meet. So that will be the next point. And then see, I'm making all the lines you know, going to the uh, a point to find the each angle. So when you see the, um, the window, you know, the, the top part a little bit more angled and the bottom part has the mild uh, angle, right? So when you uh, extend the line to the point, you can find the, you know, uh, the correct angle uh, easily to create the perspective drawing on your, uh, for your drawing. So for example, so I, I'm, I'm gonna just start it, you know, uh, start to um, draw based on this perspective guideline I made. So um, if you want to, you can um, you now make this guideline first and then draw now the details on it is optional. So um, when you find this angle, the angle of the line, um, you can just put the you know, vertical line on it. Then you know your drawing will be you know so much easier with the perfect uh, perspective angle like this. You know, see, I've already made the room based on the perspective guideline, right? It's pretty much simple. And then go find the all the vertical lines on the walls. And let me just show you how to draw the window because the window part is one of the hardest part. See, I just to find the angle now. And then just to draw all the uh, you know, vertical lines on it. It's a simple with the uh, perspective guideline. And I just draw the details. Oh, you don't need to draw all the details now. Because uh, basically this um, drawing is for uh, you know, practice to um, or understanding the perspective technique. So uh, I just want you to draw, you know, a few details in it. You don't need to fill everything in this drawing. So this is the final view. And then uh, I chose a one point for the uh, one point 
uh, linear perspective example, um, I chose like, what is that? Is this the second one? Oh, yes, this, sec this is the second option. So this is now the, the second option has only you know, one point um, perspective. So all the lines go to the center. So let me just to show you from the beginning. So see, just the same row. Draw, extend all the ceiling line and the floor line. Then find the point. And again, this is the one point perspective. So the right ceiling line also going to the same point, to the vanishing point on the center like this. And I just, you know, um, extend all the lines from the wall like this, you no. Know? So all the lines going to the center. So the right side is same, right? Just to find the right angle like that. And then when you find the vertical line, I'm sorry, the uh, perspective lines, and you can start the drawing. So based on the uh, perspective line, you can just you know draw the vertical lines on the you know, guideline. It will be so much easier like this. Find the angle, right angle. So this guide video is in the um, oh no, week 11-2 sketchbook uh, project forum. So you can you know, watch this again after this meeting. See? All the guidelines, just you know, draw the guidelines to find the right angle. And it should be go to the center because it's a one point linear perspective. So, and then I'm drawing the details. And this is the final look. So that's it. It will be so easy. So again, I want you to post it by tonight. Uh, just to post <coughs> your work process, you don't need to finish it today. You know, uh, you're gonna finish all of your artwork by the uh, you know, end of the course. And uh, please reply to your peers by uh, tomorrow. Any question? No? All right. So today meeting is done.